It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the NUS Libraries Biodiversity Seminar Series. Thank you for joining this exciting event. A million different places, possibilities and problems in recollecting pieces of Singapore by Martin Lowe from Lee Kong Chan National History Museum is the third talk in this series. Martin is a friend of the NUS Library who supports the growth and development of our biodiversity collection and Southeast Asia to meet the changing and expanding needs of the research community. Today's session will be recorded and made available online. The three talks in this series have been arranged with the generous help of Dr. Anthony Medrano of Yale NUS College. Dr. Medrano is the NUS Presidential Young Professor of Environmental Studies at Yale NUS College. We would like to express our gratitude on behalf of NUS Libraries to Dr. Medrano for organizing all the talks in this series. Dr. Medrano has also kindly agreed to moderate our event today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Medrano. Thanks so much for that introduction, Gandhi. And, and thank you all for tuning in today for um, what will be, I'm sure, a, a, um, a lovely talk, but also one that I think will point us all, all of us who are interested in, in history and in biodiversity in sources to lots of new directions, perhaps, and directions that are actually quite close to home. Um, and that is uh, uh, here in Singapore. Well, home in the sense of where we, we are now based and for those of us that play, call this place home. Um, I wanna introduce our speaker today, um, who is uh, Mr. Martin Lowe. Martin is a research associate at the Lee Kong Chin Natural History Museum um, at the National University of Singapore. Um, he's the co-author of 200 uh, Points in Singapore's Natural History, and he's contributed um, chapters to uh, Voyagers, Explorer, Explor Explorators, Explorers, I guess it is, um, Voyages, Explorers, and Scientifics, uh, the French and Natural History in Singapore. And he's got contributions as well in, um, let me just look here on my cheat sheet. Um, he's got some recent publications as well in um, Revisiting the Scholar and Statesman. In that, he's got a, a chapter called Defining the Natural World. And really before um, Martin's extensive and, and quite prolific um, endeavors into natural history of Singapore and the natural history of Singapore, he was trained um, in the biological sciences and he's a taxonomist by training. He um, works on crabs. Um, and so he's really kind of just embodies, I think in many ways, the, um, the, 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 natural, the natural and sort of traditional natural historian, the one who does the science, the culture, the history, um, the narratives, um, and, and the materials and so, so much more. We're extremely lucky to have him nearby at the Lee Kong Chin Natural History Museum. And I'm especially um, grateful to have him give uh, us a nice talk today um, entitled, A Million Different Places, Possibilities and Problems in Recollecting Pieces of Singapore. Um, and I should say too, Martin and I and Gandhi um, are all part of a Social Science Research Council grant that is um, bringing together the digital humanities and um, biodiversity history in Singapore and Southeast Asia. Martin and Gandhi are, are huge parts of that project. And um, I think without further delay, I'd like to now welcome uh, Martin to, to share with us his, uh, his what will be an exciting talk and journey. Uh, Martin? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, I'm almost embarrassed by that very, very uh, warm, glowing introduction. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much to, to all of you who are here and to the to NUS Libraries uh, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, Mrs. Lee, uh, University Librarian, um, and her, her really good, great staff, especially Gandhi. And... Um, Thank you so much for the opportunity. And if you'll just give me a minute to start the slideshow. So, um, <clears throat> sorry, as Anthony mentioned, um, I, I did start off as a science student um, at, at the life, science, uh, the life sciences program at NUS, uh, which seems like a lifetime ago. Um, but um, well, yeah, over the years, I guess things have evolved, um, especially I think with the bicentennial, um, which I think saw um, natural history 
appear to to have a, a larger role um, in in the discourse over uh, the Singapore's nat national and natural heritage. Um, I think which was a very welcome change. Uh, nice, uh, nice progression in I guess in the evolution of the way we study history, the way we try to find out more about ourselves and uh, about Singapore's history. So um, with that. Um, over that, that period, I kind of got more interested in what the non, I guess, non-science sources had to offer uh, to the biological sciences and to natural history. Um, and, and some of the research and some of the things that I will be sharing about actually came about because of this, um, this interest in, in new sources. Um, so I've entitled the talk, A Million Different Places, um, because that is basically where Singapore has ended up. So specimens of Singapore, plants, animals, um, sources, observation, data, um, you know, it's, it's basically gone everywhere um, because of the, the historical circumstances um, in Singapore's past um, as being a British colony, um, being an independent state. But um, yeah, over the course of 200 plus years of, um, I guess, active uh, natural history collecting um, and, and then scientific collecting, yeah, Singapore has ended up in a million different places. And um, I would just like to take a quick look at two um, networks of sorts um, that actually revolve around um, two books that are actually in the NUS libraries. Because I, I thought, you know, this being a, a more library-centered uh, um, program, it would be nice to actually focus on some of the material that the libraries, NUS libraries has. Um, so the first book is actually called Walkabout. Uh, which was written by Lord Moyne in uh, 1936. And it actually uh, recounts um, his travels, he and his fellow passengers, um, on the motor yacht Rosora, uh, which was built in 1905, uh, which was originally intended as a passenger ferry. Uh, but with the advent of World War I, um, it became a troop ship uh, during the five or so years of World War I. Following the end of uh, World War I, it was bought by Lord Moyne um, and converted into a luxury yacht. And amongst the many, many storied and interesting uh, passengers to have walked up the gangplank onto the Rosora was uh, the Prince of Wales and a person by the name of Wallace Simpson. And this was actually where they first met. So uh, I will let you Google. Um, if you do not already know the story of the Prince of Wales and Lord Mo and Wallace Simpson, I'll let you Google them. Um, that's a photo of the Rosora taken from um, Lord Moyne's book. Um, the, the walkabout, the narrative that we are interested in, actually recounts the voyage of the Rosora uh, between 1934 and 1935 um, through what is today Southeast Asia um, and some parts of the Pacific. Um, over about two years. Um, the journey basically starts in Singapore because uh, I guess the voyage from the Near East or what is today would be Lebanon, um, Syria, Egypt was considered to probably too arduous to undertake by such um, uh, people of uh, <laughs> rich people, I guess. So um, in order to save them that arduous journey across the Indian Ocean, um, the Rosora was sailed by its crew to Singapore and all the rich people uh, joined the Rosora in Singapore. So they flew in and they joined the Rosora. And so began the, the journey of the Rosora. And of course, Lord Moyne, um, who was then owner of the Rosora, um, features prominently. Uh, he wrote this book called The Walkabout um, of which NUS has a copy. Um, I was just talking to Gandhi about this. And since Lord Moyne has died more than 70 years ago, it, is, uh, it might be possible to actually have a, a digital copy of this book put on NUS's uh, library's Belsey portal uh, for researchers to use. There is currently no uh, electronic copy of this book uh, online. So... Um, another person who was aboard the Rosora was uh, Lady Vera Broughton. Um, she's one of the earliest and overlooked female ethnographic photographers. Um, that's her in the photo. 
carrying a gibbon. Um, her material today is um, in the British Museum. Uh, portraits of the famous people that she took while aboard the ship were, are now at the National Portrait Gallery. Um, the other famous people uh, were Stein Kellenfels and uh, Pat Noon, who are both known as uh, today as um, anthropologists and ethnographers of um, what is today Indonesia and Peninsula Malaysia. So um, Pat Noon, of course, is, a, is the subject of a book entitled uh, Noon, Noon of the Ulu, I think, um, about his um, interactions with the Aboriginal peoples in Peninsula Malaysia um, and some of the adventures he got up to. Um, the fourth network uh, or the fourth, the fourth group of people who were aboard the Rosora were Stevenson and Clementine Churchill. Um, unfortunately for military historians, Winston Churchill left the Rosora before it came to Singapore. So Winston Churchill never visited Singapore. Um, the Churchill papers are today in Cambridge. Um, their letters have been published by their daughter who edited them. So that is, a, of course, another trove. And US Libraries also has a copy of the book. Um, so that's Winston Churchill, uh, Lady Churchill, and that's Lord Moyne and Churchill uh, about the Rosora. Um, so you, there are all these photos of the people who are aboard. Um, and of course, today in the Na National Portrait Gallery, and they give us an interesting snapshot of what life was like about this luxury yacht, um, as well as the places they visited, um, some of the activities they got up to. Um, and of course, because this is a series on biodiversity talks, um, there is biodiversity. Um, so in the introduction to the walkabout, uh, Lord Moyne actually says that this is a story of a journey of 30,000 miles. Uh, the main object of, was to you know, collect ethnographic material for the British Museum and live animals for the London Zoo. And um, in the newspaper uh, on the right hand side, uh, this is the Malaya Tribune. It actually announces the arrival of Lord Moyne's gifts to the London Zoo, uh, which were mouse deers, kangaroos, cassowaries. Um, and they really collected uh, the appendix of um, animal specimens, both live and dead, runs to 13 pages. Um, so at the back of the walkabout, there's actually an uh, appendix of animals. Um, it appears that some of the animals never made it back alive. Uh, this appeared to have been preserved and presumably went to the British Museum Natural History, which is today in the Natural History Museum in London. Um, this is a table summarizing the species that were brought back, both alive and dead. And on the right, you can actually see some of the cargo being unloaded in, in England. And in the appendix, two birds from Singapore are listed. Uh, one was listed as being alive, the first one, the other was listed as being coming back dead. Um, so there is Singapore in, in, in uh, this collection. Um, there is also observations of what happened on the ship uh, while they were sailing. Um, so Lord Moyne recounts how one of the little honey bears that 